I'd like to first start out by, you know, uh, understanding a little bit more about your background. Um, I, I think it's very helpful for people to understand that, um, you know, the people that are in healthcare today might not have started uh, in healthcare, mm -hmm. and everybody's got their own journey into this space. And so, you know, kind of help us figure out, like, how did, how did you get to where you're at today? Well... I know it's a loaded question, but... Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> uh, to be honest, I had never visioned myself working in healthcare or food service. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to be a singer. Ah. So, um, but I ended up getting married, and we purchased a restaurant and um, bar when I was about 22 years of age. Wow. And again, no intention of working in there. I was um, working part-time as a CNA just to make money kind of yeah. deal. And uh, my cook didn't show up for work one day. So I got baptized by fire right. in a steakhouse. And we were pretty busy. We were in a small, um, real touristy area in the sum t summers especially. Yeah. So um, six months later, I'm running the place. And uh, we had that for about, I think, three, four years. And then right. I ended up thinking, okay, I don't want to manage anymore. I want to be a peon. And so I went to another steakhouse as a cook, and six months later, I ended up managing that for another four years. So I just couldn't seem to get away from uh, my work ethic, evidently got in the way. I did have uh, great parents that taught me, if you're going to do something, do it right. Right. And after owning a business, I had a whole new perspective on what work ethic should look like. Right. So um, I did that for four years, and I got tired of working 18-hour days. Mm -hmm. I got tired of working six days a week and getting called in on my day off and working nights. Right. Um, and uh, it turned out we found out we were going to be adopting a little boy. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, there's no way I can continue doing this with a baby in the house. Right. So my sister worked in long-term care and called me and says, hey, they're looking for a cook. And I'm like, perfect. So I went in and applied on Friday and I started on Monday. Wow. And went in as a cook and dishwasher and aid and you know how healthcare is, you end up everywhere. Right. And so I did that for about a year, and I lost my daycare. I lived in a rural, rural area, no daycare providers. Mm. Um, I, as it was, I was driving 30 miles one way to work every day. Mm. And um, I went kind of just PRN, helping out where they needed help, like on holidays or something, mm -hmm. if I had somebody that could help me out, because I did have a couple sisters that lived in the area. And they called me one day and said, hey, um, when you left, our dietary manager went out on maternity leave, and she's not coming back would you like to be the dietary manager? And I said, well, sure, but there's you know two problems. One, I don't have the education you require because they required the CDM mm -hmm. credential in North Dakota. And two, I don't have daycare. Well, we already got you on the waiting list for the new daycare provider and we'll put you through school. Okay. So wow. I went in and applied and I do remember um, my administrators asking me, are you gonna have a problem managing people you work side by side with? And I said, no but there's a few that might have a problem with me. And he goes, why is that? I said, well, I know who do th does their jobs and who I had to cover for all the time. Right. He goes, didn't think of that part. <laughs> so I ended up with the job. Um, they put me through the schooling and I mean, it just kept going from there. So I worked there for about three and a half years until mm -hmm. I moved to Wyoming. And I'd heard about Memorial Hospital Converse County and kept put my application in. I'm like, I don't care where I work. I, I want to work here. Yeah. And uh, I think I lived here about two weeks and they called me and said, Hey, our dietary manager's quitting. Would you like to apply? <laughs> and so same thing. I went in on Thursday and I had never done peer interviews before. So right. I went in on Thursday, did an interview with um, the director over that area and the dietitian. And then I came in the next day, did the peer interview with the team. And that was a really unique experience. Yeah. Um, and again, Interviewed Friday, came to work on Monday, and haven't looked wow. back. So I ran the kitchen. When I started, we had eight staff. Um, and all I had at that time for education was my CDM credential. I fortunately fell into a business that really supports education. So I went mm -hmm. back to school and worked my way through and got my master's in healthcare management. And then mm. went back and got a certification in hospitality. And I kind of made a deal with my boss that, hey, if um, I, I get all this done you know, what's the next step for me? Right. And so at that time, of course, I was just the dietary manager, which isn't just, you live yeah. in the kitchen, but he created a director of hospitality position and gave me several other departments and that just continues to grow. So That's fantastic. It, it's been, CDM opened that door and man, it just 
went fast forward from that point forward. So it, it's really interesting, um, you know, reflecting uh, on what you're saying, but also thinking about my particular situation where, you know, I also got into healthcare, you know, from the, the hospitality side of, the, of, of food service. And, and I went with a contract manager and they, you know, it was a requirement to become a certified dietary manager. Mm -hmm. And I did, and it's absolutely amazing what that certificate did to open up, you know, just your whole viewpoint and what the opportunities are in, in healthcare. Um, I don't think people really appreciate uh, how diverse a, an industry it, it can be and how rewarding and how much fun it can actually be working in, in hospitals. They're very interesting places. Yeah, a lot of hard work, but it's yeah. definitely, if you, don't have that empathy and compassion, you're definitely in the wrong field if Correct. you're in healthcare. But if you, you know, mm -hmm. love caring for people and making those connections, you're in the right right, right place. Yeah. Well that's awesome. Well and and you know, I've had the pleasure of kind of watching your growth over the last ten years, yes. uh, working with you at different uh, in different ways. And so uh, congratulations to all your success and Thank you. well deserved. Let's talk about um, you know food service and you know the evolution that you've seen over like 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 last ten years, uh, even further. I mean, you were in, in skilled nursing before, so you know, kind of describe some of the observations that you've seen, and then where it has come, and then we'll talk about when you, uh, what where you think it's going to go. So I think the biggest changes I've seen um, when I was in the nursing home, um, the Pioneer Network was just kind of starting to take off, right. where um, it was more to do with. Uh, patient rights or resident rights compared mm -hmm. to just shoving a tray at them or you're going to eat what we're putting in front of you. Right. Um, so, I mean, I kind of came in right as that was taking off. Mm -hmm. And um, the one thing I did notice during those times was people weren't eating. Right. Um, and I noticed that when I was a cook, even way before I became the CDM in that facility. So one of the first things we did is, is try to give them not necessarily a room service setup, but more of a they could pre-order if they wanted a hamburger that day and it was within their diet range. As long as they let us know a little earlier, we were trying to accommodate that. Right. So we tried to give them some more variety and tried to improve you know, what they were eating because mm -hmm. a lot of them just, well, I don't like this, and that was the only option they right. had. Um, when I came to the hospital here, um, one thing that we noticed was our press gainy, which is what we use for our, our patient satisfaction, was very poor, mm -hmm. and especially on the food service side. And there were mm -hmm. several obstacles in the way. One was we, um, again, they had a rotation menu. They could pick from one or two options, and that was it. Mm -hmm. um, we were delivering the trays up in a cart, leaving it in the hallway, and expecting nursing to pass it. Mm -hmm. So we were getting knocked on quality of food, temperature of food, mm -hmm. and then the courtesy of the person serving the tray, and we had no control over any of that. Right. And so um, we did implement room service. It took us, I suppose, almost a year. We wrote all our own menus. Mm -hmm. um, my dietitian and myself worked on those for months and months before we mm -hmm. got that put into place. And then we had to retrain our staff because um, most of my staff had been here 20 years. Right. And it was a big change from just setting up a tray line every meal time to waiting for that patient to call. Right. And so mm -hmm. we put that into place and we did start to see those numbers improve. The other thing we did is we started going to those rooms and taking those trays to the patients. Um, over the time, we brought in a contracting company to coach us through um, improving that even more. And um, we took and started, we gave them scripting, we gave them the tools, and we went from, mm -hmm. you know, just slamming a tray in there and our press gainy score is running at about the 13th percentile to we haven't dropped below the 90s in the last six years. Wow. So it really made a change. Sure. But as we improved there, we had more people in the community coming in because those changes were also reflected in our cafe. Mm -hmm. We had more staff eating in. Um, we ended up picking up a contract for the local um, detention center, the jail. And they came to us, said, hey, your food's great. We want to offer that to our inmates. Mm -hmm. And we did that for multiple years. We became the caterer of choice in town just because, I mean, we were a hospital for, you know, that sure. was crazy, and especially in a critical access hospital right. that we were able to. So I started with eight staff, and I think at the, my peak, I was up to 25 right. just in that department trying to balance all of those. So mm. it's, it's grown just really quick, especially mm -hmm. in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. Just the expectation for food service, people are watching the Food Network. They... 
They have yes. their preferences. They they don't want just institutional food anymore. Well, and another thing I think we, we should all talk a little bit about is understanding that when you live in a more rural area or remote area, uh, a senior living community or the, 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 the hospital in the area is, is a huge economic driver and, and it's, a big, it's a big organization in a small area. So the roles of food service uh, can be quite large what you do for not only the building, but also the community at large and how it integrates uh, the community with the hospital. My previous director always said we were going to draw them in with food because mm -hmm. that was one thing we did excel at. And right. so he used every opportunity um, to promote the food side of it to get people in the door. Right. And we are the second largest employer in the county so I mm -hmm. mean we already have a large kind of captive audience right and of course when you're a patient or in there for a procedure another captive audience and then that reputation just continues to grow right but it became almost a necessity in a lot of ways too because there weren't places for people to go eat sure or you know we expanded to a Sunday brunch because their only option in the community was Pizza Hut right so I mean, we just kind of adapted to what the needs of the community at that time were saying. Right, right. And same with the catering. We did that because there wasn't anybody in the area that was doing it. And now there's some businesses that are doing it. So we've stepped back. Right. And pulled back into doing what we do good, which is the patient care. Right. Well, you know, it's interesting <clears throat> in speaking with um, uh, financial people and, and whatnot, you know, it's it, there's a fine line in the hospital world of, trying to offset the cost of patient care with, with revenue from retail and staying on mission. Uh, you know, I've been to places where, you know, the food service director or the chef, or whatever, is kind of a little bit off the reservation in terms of, you know, trying to be, you know, everything to everybody else, but not the patients. And then there's the flip side where all they think about is the patient, but they don't really put any emphasis on the retail side. Uh, so you, you kind of need to find that balance and probably work with senior leadership to understand the dynamics of that. Is that It's a hard fairway? balance, yeah. too, especially when you've got that many moving parts, yeah. um, you know, in your kitchen, if you're doing all those different things, the catering, the um, doctor's lounge, the patient care, the mm -hmm. retail. Um, what we found worked the best for us was we had specific positions dedicated to that patient care so that we didn't lose that focus. And then oh, in the constant, you know, auditing on those trays, making sure that the audits for the scripting are being done, that the people are following our protocols and that those trays are going up there. And then keeping your thumb on that press gainy, seeing what our patients are saying, you know, helps mm -hmm. us catch it before it became a problem. Right. And we could always tell when we ran short staffed and everybody was kind of spread a little thin because my press gainy scores would drop down because mm -hmm. we were trying to take too many trays up at one time instead of spicing them out appropriately so those temperatures held. And you could almost every time my press gainy dropped, I could go back and look at the amount of overtime my staff was working and see where that balance was, was slipping. Oh, that's and interesting. And so like COVID kind of gave us an excuse to cut back in some of those extra areas and pull our focus back to where that priority needed to right. be. And we're still accommodating the community right now we're feeding the folks from the senior center because they're under a remodel right so i mean we're still doing all that other stuff but we were able to pull back and really put that focus back on that patient care and we've seen louder, larger censuses than we've had in the past too so again that was kind of a rude awakening to us like oh wow you know we, we're not used to taking care of this many people on the floor where a lot of times that patient care people was our overflow on the retail side and oh, not right. the other way around. Right. Now we're pulling from the retail side to keep that patient care where it needs to be. Oh, that's interesting, actually. Yeah. So in terms of, you know, the training of your staff, well, actually, let's start, let's roll back. Let's talk about uh, your recruiting practices and what you're looking for, uh, you know, because one of the reasons why we do these interviews and have these conversations is to promote to the world outside of healthcare um, that there's really viable career paths um, in hospitals uh, and senior living communities. And so what, how do you, you know, find people and what are you looking for in, in recruits? Um, I don't necessarily look so much for the food service experience. Mm -hmm. 
um, again, small community, there's a lot of limitations on where they'd even be able to get that experience. Right. So I don't really focus so much on that. If they have it, great. If they're not, it's still not going to count against you. Mm -hmm. I look for their customer service. I look for their um, kindness. Mm. I can teach the skill. I can't teach them to be nice. Right. And they're dealing with people. We see people on their worst and their best days. Right. And so I want somebody that can go up there and be empathetic and understanding. You know, even if nursing's calling down and they're 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 fried or busy and they're a little sharp on the phone, that they can step back and say, okay, wait a minute, they got a lot going on today. Right. Instead of just getting all bent out of shape. So I try to look for people with really strong character in those ways. I can teach the skill. I can't teach you to be compassionate. Right. I can't teach you to be empathetic with that patient that's you know, just lost all control of everything and they're angry and they're mean and I mean, and mm -hmm. still go in there and be kind and smile and, and provide that care. Right. So um, that is our biggest focus when we're recruiting. I also look at somebody that's willing to learn. Yes. Because again, even if they come with that experience, if, especially if it's from, like you said, hospitality or fast food or whatever that is, Healthcare is a whole different animal. Mm -hmm. And so if they're not willing to come in and learn and be willing to listen, it's just going to be a battle every yes. step of the day. And for them and me, it's not, it's not going to be a good working relationship. Right. I think one of, one of the big differences, you know, having work in, in all these different environments is, you know, when you're working in, a, say, a hotel or a restaurant and you have a role to play, it's kind of a narrow focus, like this is what you're supposed to do. And it almost becomes, I don't want to say like a factory worker mentality, but it, it, it's sort of a rote thing. You're kind of doing the same thing all the time. Well, in a hospital environment, um, it's not really that way. I mean, one day you're walking in and you're, you could be dealing with a multitude of situations. It's no day is the same, is it? No, and it can change within an hour. Right. You can come in thinking, oh, I got six patients today. It's going to be a gravy dray and surgeries get done and people are coming into the ER. Next thing you know, you have full census and you're running around just nuts trying right. to keep up with everything. And something that my staff don't experience that often is altered textures. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of those specialty diets, tube feedings, because mm -hmm. that's just not something we see on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when those come in, it, they have to pause a minute and like reset, okay, yeah, this is how we do this, because it's, they could go months without having ever an altered texture. Right. And so that sometimes will really throw them, um, especially if it's a newer staff member that maybe only did it one time. Right. And they've been there six months. And so when you, when you see like the fall with the uptick with flu season or those kind of things, and then we see more of those folks come through from the nursing home or those other areas. Otherwise, the rest of the time, we don't see that. Right. And so that really is difficult for them to sometimes flip that gear and say, wait a minute, am I doing this right? Right. So if you have, if somebody is, is starting uh, in, in this career path, uh, you know, getting into, into the hospital, let's say they're even starting in the dish room. Explain the processes that are involved or that you have in place or you recommend where the development of that person and uh, what they can do both personally and professionally and where that can go and how do they get there? Well, I do that in two ways. I have one theory and I tell every staff member I hire this, my goal is you leave here better than when you came in. Mm -hmm. Even if you're here for a month, I want you to go away with something that you learned. Mm -hmm. Um, we do provide surf safe training or at least some sort of a food safety training. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily require the certification, but I need them to know those basics. Right. Um, so that's something we've re relied on. We use the Pineapple Academy, mm -hmm. um, especially for a lot of the new staff that have never worked in food service because mm -hmm. then take an eight hour surf safe class, they're only going to remember this much right. of what I just harped on and spending an eight hour day with me is not fun. right right so you know for me to give them little snippets here and there <laughs> and assign them and then follow up with them that competency piece so that's really helpful right because then i can see did they understand what they were learning right um we do a lot of hands-on one-on-one with them but then i always tell them if this isn't the place for you i don't want you coming to a job you don't want to be at right i don't want you miserable because you're not doing yourself a favor and you're not doing your team a favor Mm -hmm. um, we encourage education. Again, I work for a great company that's really great at supporting that. Mm -hmm. um, we work in a rural community, which means I have access to funding that maybe other places I wouldn't have had. So there's opportunities for me to get free scholarships for them. I've got uh, students right now, three of them enrolled in the CDM course, 
all paid 100% free through the state of Wyoming through those scholarship programs. So right. there's tools out there if you're willing to look for them. Um, there's workforce development grants to help. And it doesn't matter what program they're going into. If they want to go to a food show and just learn, if they want to attend a conference, if they want to take the CDM course. Mm -hmm. um, I've had, I have one taking their CNA courses right now. I don't care. Oh, that's terrific. I want them to, you know, follow their heart and, and enjoy what they're doing. Mm -hmm. If they stay with me, all the better. If they don't, at least we gave them the opportunity to learn something new. Right. So right. Um, I'm always big about with my team. If you want to learn something or if there's something you're interested, come talk to me. I yeah. will help you figure it out. Figure it out. Because right. I had support doing the same thing, and I want to make sure my team feels that same support. Yeah, I think I think it's that it's a really critical aspect of the work environment we find ourselves in. I mean, you know, it's been being talked about for a long time that the workforce is shrinking. And, and, and I don't think a lot of people really grasp that until here we are, you know, we're, we're still in a pandemic, uh, by, but it's been, it's very clear that a lot of people aren't going to return to the workforce. And the fact that, you know, we're in a baby boomer situation right now in this country. I mean, that, that 65 and older is becoming the largest population in the country. And so therefore, there's huge sections of, of the economy that aren't getting personnel that, that is to do the work. So people have choices these days. So how do you create that space or that environment where people want to come work for you? I wish I knew the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> we just had this discussion yesterday <clears throat> at um, our senior leadership meeting that, yeah. you know, people, the economy is so weird right now with the money that was poured into um, you know, offset all the stuff that happened with COVID. Right. People aren't applying for jobs. Right. Um, they were discussing even like in our business office, RNs. I mean, we've got so many openings that usually you have a stack of applications, even in our small community. Right. We have none. I, I don't know the answer to that when they can go out there and name their prices and they have options where before maybe they didn't have those options or that much, um, power and naming this mm -hmm. is what I want to be paid right um, we're bringing in travelers on that on the nursing and the radiology side just to cover shifts right uh, food service we're not so fortunate that means we work doubles or whatever I, I wish I knew the answer to that right. and especially I'd like to say it's just in the small rural communities but I just came back from a conference in right. June and everybody's struggling with those same it, it same issues is. and it's in the school districts it's not just healthcare mm -hmm. it's everywhere hospitality, um, same thing, the conference, you'd go to a restaurant and half the restaurants closed down because they just right. don't have staff. I, I don't know how you can get people to, right. to come to work when they're getting free money. Right. Well, yeah. I, I do think that's going to change here in a little bit, and I think that's going to shift. But I think, I think the key thing is to realize that um, in, in the world of healthcare, senior living and hospitals, both EVS and food service, there's a lot of support companies out there. I mean, your vendor suppliers and all the different brands of, of equipment and supplies and food, everybody has a vested interest in supporting this arena because it's, it's big business, you know, for other businesses. I think one of the key things that, that my takeaway in all this is, is to also educate the suppliers and everybody else in, in this world that, that we call healthcare, food service, and EVS to understand that you need products and, and supplies and things that are uh, easier to handle from a labor point of view, but also keeps that quality up so you can still do your job and, um, and looking for tools and equipment so that you're not as labor um, focused, um, you know, like uh, the one example I love to talk about is, you know, slicing and dicing onions. Sorry, but if you don't have people, enough people no. to do it, you need to buy your onions diced and sliced and ready to go. I mean, it's just, it's just how it is. Um, why do you want to spend money on someone sitting in the back prepping vegetables when, you know, they should be out there servicing the patients, servicing the customers, uh, not worrying about whether, you know, we can do 10 pounds of onions and, in an hour. <laughs> right. Well, and I think those those are great tools too because you can still make a good homemade 
-hmm. from scratch meal, you're just not putting all the prep work in on the front right. side of it on basically menial tasks that take up a lot of time. Right. And you're still getting a nice quality product. And right. like you said, you can focus more on the end product instead of all the work that goes into just right. getting it prepped to be prepared. So, yeah. You know, one of the things that, that I try to get out there and talk about is we're going to have to cut out the middle part of this production piece. Um, you're never going to get rid of, you know, inventory control and sanitation and cleaning and all the things that are, asked, uh, are important there. And you're never going to get away from, as you said, the final product in that touch point. But that middle piece of prep, um, whatever we can do as an industry to eliminate the manpower out of that middle piece is where everybody's going to win uh, and be able, still be able to do their job. Well, and I think with the labor shortages right now, even that is a huge piece. Mm -hmm. Now the catch is the affordability and making sure you're still able to keep your, you know, patient plate cost where it needs to be right. or your overall budget for the month. If, you know, if you're offsetting it with maybe a higher cost prepped item, your labor should be reflecting exactly. that you're not putting all that time into making those products too. Right. I think that's one of the things that, and, and we, and I know you hear this all the time uh, with your involvement with ANFP and whatnot, but um, understanding your numbers and benchmarking and becoming proficient at the accounting side of this business and in, in the job and responsibilities you have, that's a pretty critical part. Um, it's not a nice to have anymore. It's like you have to understand where your numbers are coming from. I can remember 10 years ago, my one of my mentors told me, if you know your numbers yeah. and you can go in and make money, they'll never tell you no. Right. And I remember the first time I got to go in and they asked me questions and I had all those numbers in front of me and right. said, this is what I need. And our chief medical officer said, she's the only one in the building making money, give her whatever she wants. <laughs> I will never, ever forget that meeting. Well, it, it was, sounds like it was amazing. Good advice. I, it was excellent. <laughs> anybody I know? Yeah, Kathy Stevens. It's Kathy yeah, Stevens, well, that makes Kathy. sense. She, she always Stevens. told me, if right. you go in there and you can, on a dime, answer that question, you've got it. And yeah. I, I thought, yeah, whatever. And the first time I went in there and I had to present that, and we were on a labor freeze, we were in the middle of, um, we are in an oil and gas boom industry. Mm -hmm. So it's either crash or boom. We were in a crash. Um, they'd just <laughs> done a major layoff to like 400 miners at the mines here in the community. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything was falling out at the bottom. We mm -hmm. were trying to figure out how we were going to keep going because surgeries are getting canceled and all this stuff. And I needed cooking equipment. My, my stove kept catching on fire and Right. I needed all this stuff, and um, so I put this proposal together and had all my, my ducks in a row, and I went in there, and I got out of that meeting, and I went and I called Ref. I'm like, you were so right, <laughs> and it even worked even better because we use our GPO, and I have a really great right. contact with my GPO, and so when we ordered that equipment, it still came in several thousand dollars under what I had budgeted or had submitted for my bid. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened we also needed a vehicle for delivering meals. And so they went and bought me a catering van. So it was it was so cool. I'll never forget that. But I love those tools. Yeah. And my accounting tools are updated daily. My boss doesn't even question anything I'm doing. I'm mm -hmm. probably one of the few directors in the building that doesn't get questioned on, hey, you know, why is your money this way? Well, this is what happened because he knows I've got the information. You know the information. And right. I'm usually on the phone calling them if something looks weird before they catch it. Right. Saying, hey, my deposits don't look right. Something's not right here. What would you say to operators who they, they really understand the operational aspects of their business and, and they're good at it and, and all that, but they have uh, a, cons a perception that they're really not good at finances or they don't understand how to, how to put it all together? I mean, what, what little step-by-step -step advice would you give those kind of operators? So on the EVS side, that one's kind of sometimes a little difficult because it's a non-revenue department, right. completely non-revenue. Um, utilizing your GPO as much as you possibly can. If you have the opportunity to have a really good working relationship with, if you have a purchasing department that helps you navigate some of that mm -hmm. that is a great way to really get those cost savings make sure you're getting in you know instead of three products that are the same thing you know getting it down to where it's standardized because it makes it easier for the supply chain those mm -hmm. kind of deals um 
working with your suppliers. Um, there's different companies that you can lease from instead of purchasing that may save you money mm -hmm. in the long run. Um, we do our own laundry, so some laundry we do ourselves, others because of maybe the numbers just we can't keep up with, we lease, mm -hmm. you know, just trying to find those balances to save money in those areas. Mm -hmm. And then just keep an eye on your bottom line. Keep an eye on what you budgeted for. If something goes off key, make sure that's right. You know, right. it's going to happen. I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't, but at least you know why. And then you're more prepared in the future. Or if something goes offline and it wasn't supposed to be, mm -hmm. you know, that high. Or, or you noticed maybe your supply cost was really low that month. What what made that difference? Mm -hmm. Just paying attention to that makes a huge mm -hmm. difference, especially on the EBS side. Because, again, you don't have that revenue to offset any of that. Right. And labor especially. Make sure you're staffed appropriately for the amount of space you have or what work you are doing. Because that will kill your department. And that is right. your largest cost. Well, it's interesting, you know, from a benchmarking point of view with EVS, um, I, you know, I heard something um, which really resonated. It's really managing uh, the FTE load based on the number of, number one, total square footage, but also the type of yes. space. So the, the time it takes to, to clean, disinfect a patient room or an operating room versus, say, a public area it's like night and day. They're completely different products, different results that you're looking for and in time commitment. So it would seem to me that if you're going to be managing your EVS, you better know the square footage of all types of spaces so that when the conversations come around your FTEs and your labor pool, you can justify and say, hey, you know, I've got this many square feet of clinical space that I have to disinfect. And I've got this many square feet of spaces that are just public areas that just have to stay clean and nice and uh, and really approach it from, from that point of view. And there's great tools out there to help you navigate that and telling mm -hmm. you how many minutes should be spent in those areas right. in order to clean those. Um, it also comes down to the tools you're using. So like your public areas, like your corridors, if you're doing it manually compared to a writing machine, those right. numbers are going to vary. So there's great tools out there, um, and you're right. You need to know the square footage of every bathroom, yeah, every patient room, every office, yeah, and so that you can do that appropriately for the size of your facility. Right. And yeah, it makes a big difference. Now, if you're doing extra things, also say um, using ultraviolet lights or going in right. with the um, electrostatic sprayers, that's going to add a little more time on there because that's another step mm -hmm. that you're adding into that process. Right. That's mm -hmm. interesting. You know, I was, when I was in the hotel business, I, I obviously was over, oversaw a lot of housekeeping and, and things, but it's fascinating the equipment um, that's out there to help speed up a job or make things simpler. You know, it's worth researching. Uh, I, I can think of one in particular was um, the backpack vacuums. When those came out, the ability to like do stairwells mm -hmm. and, and go into spaces it was so easy compared to the old style or another style of vacuum cleaner. Yeah. I know it sounds like a, a little silly thing, but I mean, when you look at it from a productivity point of view, uh, there are tools out there that can make any job easier, better. It's just, it's just finding that right balance of expense of the equipment versus the manpower in, in making sure that you can justify it. And, and, and the amount sense. of time you're going to use it. If it's something you're only going to use once a month, there, there you, you know, the, right. it may that not be sense. worth investing in. Right. You know, if you have, you know, an area that just doesn't need it done as often, that That's makes right. a big change too. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Talk about, uh, first, talk about your relationship with the accounting office, and then, and then I want to talk about benchmarking. Okay. So my relationship with the accounting office is great because that's my boss. Right, I report which is to the different. CFO. I mean, not yes. yeah. I mean, people. You have to realize not everybody reports yep. to a CFO, but I think it's interesting that you do. Yes. So that that is a change for me. My previous director was the COO, and then right. they did some shuffling. Um, again, they kind of just leave me alone due to the fact that I I know my numbers. I know right. my patient cost per day. Um, on the food service side, I we turn in a staffing report. It's not required, but he's provided a staffing report every Monday mm -hmm. on this is what we did last week, mm -hmm. and this is the why. If there's something weird, it's marked in there, so he doesn't have to come ask me those questions. Mm -hmm. And we have it running for, I have several years. I can pull up any week 
and show them that information. Mm -hmm. um, I also have a monthly meeting with um, my, what they call accounting liaison. Mm -hmm. And we go over all my financials for all my departments. And we discuss anything that looks weird, something that might be too high, something might be missing. Mm -hmm. um, I track all my deposits on a daily basis. And I have access to go in, not only look at what I say I submitted, but what they show they actually received. Oh, right. So I can go in once the day after the deposit's been submitted to mm -hmm. accounting and make sure that's reflected accurately. Mm -hmm. um, we had a glitch in our, um, our and this came because of learning the hard way, uh, our com credit card company. Right. Something was happening where it wasn't processing our credit card payments, and we ended up between the coffee shop and the cafe with about $500. Um, I think it might even been more. Maybe it was 5000 I can't remember. It was a lot. Mm -hmm. Like six months that credit card receipts had not processed properly. Oh, wow. And we lost all of that. So now, on a daily basis, we check those reports, make sure those batches are going through right. correctly. At the end of the month, we verify that those numbers match. So again, one of those things you learned the hard way. That's a hard lesson to learn. But it's something you never questioned. Right. Credit card process went through. We turned in a report. It should have been there. Um, right. So we, we keep our basically our thumb on those numbers every day. Yeah. And then again, I meet with that. Um, and if I go, she sends me the reports before I meet with her. I go through them. If there's anything I don't feel comfortable with or mm -hmm. just don't know what it is or question it, I mark it. She usually knows what I'm going to ask. So she'll have it marked and mm -hmm. already have the answer on that paper when I come in. Like, what was this payment for? I don't recognize this one. Right. And if it's something that shouldn't have been to my department, because it does happen, we get it oh, corrected. Oh, you mean like a charge off to a... It like should have, you know, maybe should have went to materials or housekeeping mm -hmm. or wherever. If it wasn't supposed to be mine, we make sure it gets transferred to the appropriate area. So it's just really having that working relationship, paying mm -hmm. attention. Um, we also do, uh, uh, what do you call it? We call them a stewardship report out about every quarter mm -hmm. where I have to get up in front of all of our leadership of the whole organization and explain why my money's where it's at. Mm -hmm. You know, where my, why my revenue, where I think it should be and why, if it's under what's going on. Right. And if my cost is high, why? And they go for anything that's over, I think it's like 20% off of what we budgeted for. Wow. And so they they keep us accountable for it, which I love because I already got the information. It's not a big deal for right, us. Right, right. So, yeah, it's um, a new process, and I like it's it. It's a good culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I like that. So talk about benchmarking. Kind of explain what that is and what the tools are available to most food service directors. Uh, I, I know there's a number, so... Yeah, and I know you know several about them, different. So. Yeah, I've utilized a couple different programs. Um, I've used the AHF um, Express Benchmarking Program mm -hmm. in the past. Um, I use the ANFP Benchmark um, Acute Care mm -hmm. Benchmarking Program now. Um, what benchmarking does for me, it helps me in two ways. One, it helps me on showing my cost per patient day um, because that information's in there. So mm -hmm. I can go back to my boss and say, "This is this is what nationally." I'm doing compared to other facilities. Right. And, you know, that's a way for him to hold me accountable as to where I should be. Mm -hmm. um, the other great thing about it also helps me with my labor because I can go back in there and say, all right, I'm doing this many meals. And this is where my cost is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is where I should be labor wise. And so that helps me with those conversations. And mm -hmm. then, you know, when there's a question, when I'm, I get to input all my budget information each year. And having those tools mm -hmm. available to say, you know, nationwide, this is what you look at for a facility my size. Right. We do struggle with benchmarking because of the different things that we do in our facility. It does sometimes throw our numbers a little weird when we were doing like major caters and mm -hmm. those kind of things. I always fell out of parameters because my food cost is going to look weird right. because it's going to alter the cost right. on my patient day. Mm -hmm. So just taking those things into consideration and knowing how to navigate that makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. But the benchmarking, what it really does is it helps me go back to my boss and say, I'm meeting the national best practice. Right. Th this is what they say we should be at. This is what other facilities are doing. And this is where I'm at according to that number. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, If I'm above it, what do I need to tweak? If I'm below it, you know, are we doing okay or do we need to revisit to make sure, mm -hmm. you know, we're not cutting corners somewhere? So I think some of the takeaway on that is <clears throat> there's basically two or several types of tools that are out there that 
you have access to as a director, you know, right now, and one would be through an association, mm -hmm. which I would highly recommend both the organizations that you mentioned, uh, because it's a great place for networking and learning and peer to peer, uh, you know, um, uh, career development. But there's also your food distributor and your GPO that you use, yep. which I don't think is a hospital on the planet in this country anyway, that does not have a GPO that's affiliated with. Uh, and some, somewhere or another, you're paying for that service anyway. Right. Uh, let's face it, um, when you're buying your food and, and supplies. So, you know, take advantage of those tools. Well, and your GPO gives you reporting too. Right. They're going to show you where you can save money. They're going to show you, you know, what items maybe you could try. And, you know, they're going to work with you on making sure you're getting the best deal for right. your money as well. Ideally, yes. Yes. It doesn't, it doesn't excuse you as the director, though, for not understanding because, I mean, they have their agenda, too. Yeah. So <laughs> well, let's just be clear. Uh, yeah. Not everybody has the exact same uh, objectives in this right. uh, finance uh, discussion. But, um, yes, so take advantage of the tools that right. are out there, you know. And if one isn't working, find something different. Right. Or use multiple and pull the pieces you need from those. Right. You know, not there's not one f tool that works for every every setting mm -hmm. by any means and that right. that goes as far as your gpo your goes through your benchmarking programs you know even mm -hmm. do both compare or two or three and compare right find the tool that works the best for you and you know in some cases sometimes you have to build your own tool yeah and, that's true and you know depending on what you're doing in your facility to make sure you're getting the information you need right um, not only for you but for your higher ups and you know to do your reporting appropriately right. The, the other thing, I, you know, is from my observation too, you know, some, some directors, we all have our strengths and weaknesses when it comes to management and skill sets and whatnot. But, you know, one of the more effective positions that I have seen, if it's implemented correctly, is having somebody on in your department who is managing numbers for you, who is doing the data entry, who's doing the reporting, so that, um, you know, some of us are more detailed than others. And so um, some of us are great on bigger pictures. Some of us are, are really good on the, the really minutia details. Uh, and so sometimes as a director, you have to acknowledge your strengths and weaknesses and find that complement to your style of management so that you can continue doing the little things you like to do, but you might need a little help with some detail work. And I'm, I happen to be one of those people, but- yeah, uh, I have a team, I, I right? don't argue that. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's numbers sitting down and data entry is not my strength right. by any means. It'll get done. I'm just not going to be as efficient well, at it. Or you have timely. to understand it. I mean, not yeah. it's not you can't it's not you can't dump it on someone and just think it's like being taken care of. But I, I think, you know, I think people just have to appreciate uh, we all have a little bit different management styles and, and strengths and weaknesses. And you just have to recognize what they are and mm -hmm. take advantage. I, I mean, there's there's nothing to say. Um, you know, a cook or anybody in your team couldn't help you with admin. I mean, there's, there's no rule book that says you can't, you know, use somebody, an hourly person to help with certain types of tasks. And having them cross-trained multiple cross -trained. people, you have backup and backup for that. So mm -hmm. say I have somebody that does that on a daily basis and they're on vacation. Right. Does that fall back on me or do I have somebody else that can step in and fill right. that role? So having more and more people cross train not only helps get the job done, but they also understand the process and the why behind it better. Right. Too. Well, you know, you brought up cross training. So let's talk about cross training. You're, you're over multiple departments. So why don't you explain what those are and then, you know, talk about your, how you view cross training. So um, I actually have four departments that have staff, mm -hmm. um, housekeeping, um, the food service, the coffee shop, and then um, I have diabetic education as well. So uh, my dietitian, I'm very, fab, very, very fortunate to have a dietitian that will step in and cover a shift in my kitchen if I need be. Mm -hmm. She knows all our processes. She's, she's taken the initiative. It wasn't an expectation, but she's taken the initiative to come mm -hmm. in and, and learn how to cook or aid or whatever the case may mm -hmm. be. She's helped with caters. She's fabulous. So mm -hmm. I'm very fortunate there. So the cross training between that not only helps her build relationships with my team, when mm -hmm. she's in there giving them diet education or helping them with some patient care, mm -hmm. but it also gives her the opportunity that she does inpatient and outpatient. She might have a slow day and we're struggling. 
she can step in and not miss a beat. Right. It's great. Uh, housekeeping and food service. I, my ultimate goal is to make that all just one hospitality department and quit breaking them apart for that very same reason. Mm -hmm. I would love the opportunity to cross train more mm -hmm. where we can push people from one department to the other. Right now, everybody that's in the coffee shop or previous cafe positions. Mm -hmm. They can be pulled in at any time. I have several in my cafe that are cross trained at the coffee shop. Mm -hmm. So that's just, it's great backup. Right. So if one department's struggling and the other one can spare a person, you have the opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. And you don't always have those options. And it's been a really hard sell, uh, especially like with our HR department, because that's just a different concept than it's been done in 30 years. Right. And so it really throws it people throws the weird. It coding off. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's like, so give really? me a it's code to put, to put this person there. <laughs> you know, just give them multiple codes so I can select which right. one I need. Yeah. It's, it's been really difficult in navigating some of that. But right. if we've managed to work it. I would love to do it more. I would really, my ultimate goal eventually would even to have them cross train for a day in shadow with a CNA on the floor. Yes. Get an understanding of what that staff is going right. through. Um, and have them come down to our department the same thing so that when they call down and want a juice. That's right. And they don't understand why it takes us 10 minutes to get up there. They can see what our day to day work right. looks like and just give each other Great more of an point. appreciation or understanding. But is that empathetic? To, I mean, you have to be mm -hmm. empathetic across all lines, you know, between yeah. departments. Well, and one department might be just slammed. Right. And you're down in your own little world and you have no idea right. what's happening two floors away. Right. And so sometimes they get a little, we have to have that reminder that we need to give each other some grace. Yes, that's a really, really well put. So, the, to, so there's a buzzword out there these days, um, and, and, and I have mixed feelings about it. But uh, it's the universal worker. Yeah, I'm not fond of that. <laughs> so, so I mean, I like to talk about it a little bit. I mean, first of all, in my opinion, I, I think it's great that you have specialists in everything, whether mm -hmm. it is doing the floors, or baking the cake, or delivering the the food to the patient room. I mean, these are specialty. These take skills. Yes. I mean, you have to learn how to do this stuff. Um, so. To think that everybody can do everything, uh, not not so much, uh, but I think the concept behind universal worker, I think, is really just what we're just talking about, is the ability to cross train and build better bridges between the departments. How, how do you feel about it? Well, I I think you're right. It's you still need those people that you're going to have that little bit higher skill set mm -hmm. in those areas in order to number one, keep you compliant with code right. or regulations. Right. For somebody to step in for a day and say, hey, you know, here's an extra pair of hands, I can help wherever, you can usually shuffle somebody around, put them in an area where maybe the training isn't as, isn't as extensive, right. and pull one of your other people into that other area where the need is more important. Makes so, sense, right. you know, if somebody came in from the daycare and said, hey, I've got some extra help today, where, where do you need me? I can put them cutting onions and peppers. Right. Instead of serving patient trays where I have to worry about hand etiquette and whether they're doing the scripting and they're doing those patient verification, you know, that they're following all those. Mm -hmm. Is that diet accurate? Are they getting the right mm -hmm. textures or, you know, I can put them in an area where they can stand out on my cafe line and scoop a tray up. Mm -hmm. That's a little bit different. Cash register is going to take a little longer to train. Mm -hmm. um, preparing or serving a patient meal is going to take a little longer to train. Right. I want, I, those are the areas I don't want to cut corners in. Correct. I can cut corners in who's putting my stock away for the day. Right. I can cut corners in who's doing dishes. Right. Um, a lot of times I'll stop in and do dishes to free my people up to take care of the other areas because sure. I can do the dishes and stay out of their way. Now, if they need help in the patient area, then I'll pop in and start delivering trays or help cook wherever. Right. But um, I'm a firm believer, too, that anybody on my management team should be able to step in there at any given time. I don't care what you're wearing. Right. I got extra uniforms in the building if need you help, need to change right. clothes. Um, you need to be part of your team. Right. And if you can't get in there and do the job that you're asking your team to do, you shouldn't be a director or a manager. Couldn't agree with you more on that one. So let's talk about training. Let's talk about, you know, w what the processes that, that you that have been historically been being done, but now let's talk about, you know, some of the new tools that are out there and what you're what you're doing around that. So on the cafe side, you know, we haven't really changed a lot of our tools. We've been pretty, pretty set in our standards for about going on 10 years now. Right. You know, new but staff to, come but in. But to be clear, you had a very uh, 
high-end program to train yes. and set it up. So it's, yes. Now it's just retraining it's and just holding people. Now it's keeping it at that level. Yeah. So yes. just, just so people understand, I mean, yes. you've, you've been working on this for a long time yes. and, and I've had the pleasure of helping on from time to time on that. And so you've been very dedicated, doggedly working on that. So right. that's, this isn't new for you. No, that one, that one we, like you said, we started like some 13th percentile. Our, yeah. our surveys were horrible. And we dug in and did what it took to get mm -hmm. the job done, and we've maintained that. Mm -hmm. It's uh, staff turnover always impacts that. Getting those folks up to that par, um, short staffness, things start to slide or things get cut. Mm -hmm. You know, just keeping people on task with that. You always have to keep an eye on what's going on. Right. Um, and on the EVS side, you know, there's new tools out there. There's new, um, you know, the ultraviolet lights was something we implemented a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Now we have two of them, the training, you know, and getting people to understand what they do and do not do. Mm -hmm. um, and in, even getting your nursing staff or your doctors to understand, okay, this isn't, this isn't going to fix everything. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this is what we can do and this is what we can show it, it qualifies. Mm -hmm. COVID hit, everything was electrostatic sprayers. I think we bought 15 of the things and sent them to all our clinics. Right. And they're everywhere, training people on them great tool but it doesn't replace the fact that you still need to clean right. before you do those it and is not so, yeah to be clear electric electrostatic sprayers do not clean no they just disinfect people clean <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> pieces of equipment yeah. can you know send out stuff to to disinfect or yeah. sanitize yes but uh, it is not a tool for cleaning yeah. so it, it's just getting people to understand um, not only your staff but the people that they're servicing right what that does and what it doesn't do right and you know what they to expect from that yeah obviously you know we're very uh excited about online learning we think online learning is is where the future is at um and, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that you know we, we i mean i hate using this term but i mean it, it, it makes a lot of sense when you hear it, you know this youtube society i mean we're very used to looking up stuff uh, on, on, a, on a website um, or on a browser to find information on anything you can think of, it's out there. Um, so how do you use online learning and what do you see the advantages, disadvantages, and what are the type of things that you'd like to see on online learning? So we do use the Pineapple Academy right now currently for my food service team. Mm -hmm. um, what I love about it is I don't have to pull them out of the kitchen for eight hours to mm -hmm. be serve safe trained. Mm -hmm. um, we're kind of utilizing that to maybe replace that long-term goal. Mm -hmm. um, I also like the fact that if I see somebody that maybe isn't washing their hands properly or, you know, not or dressing appropriately, you know, give them that five minute, sit down and look at this, and then I'm going to do a competency on that. Mm. It's, it saves more time for my staff when they can sit and do one or two classes compared to sitting for eight hours for a serve safe right. um, certification and they're getting the same basic information right um, what I also like about it is I can find an area that maybe we just need to fine-tune on and I can pick who I assign that to because mm -hmm. it may be relevant just to those folks or I can do it for the whole team mm -hmm. um, it gives me some flexibility of and I'm still not pulling them out of my kitchen for eight mm -hmm. hours a day to be trained um, some of the struggles we see with it is I still have some of them staff that just aren't computer savvy. Mm -hmm. um, so they have a hard time remembering passwords, how to log in, <laughs> how to turn the volume up, you know, so you have mm -hmm. to kind of handhold to get those folks through some of those. Once you get them going, they're usually pretty much yeah. okay. But if there's something goes wonky with the video or the, like we did our training yesterday and the internet went off, I can see those people like I'm done for the day, you know? So, right. I mean, I still see some struggles there. Um, there's certain things that you can train great that way. Mm -hmm. And a lot of, you know, the hands-on work stuff is fabulous. The learning to be a teammate, the learning to be a um, more compassionate person or mm -hmm. how to handle tough situations. Sometimes those still have to be those in-person one-on-one no doubt. trainings where you're having those interactions or role-playing in order mm -hmm. to get that through. Mm -hmm. um, I still will quiz my folks and, you know, I'll have a free coffee card for the coffee shop like, okay, who can raise their hand and do the scripting for me for the patient room right now? And we will do that, and they'll get a $10 coffee card. And, oh, wow. Um, so we do that as every once in a while just to 
kind of, again, check in and say, all right, how confident are you that you know all the answers to this? Right. And if they get it right, they get the copy card. If they don't, we move to the next person. Right. And then we go through where they missed. And I don't put anybody on the spot and say, Greg, okay, you're going to do it today. Are you ready? I don't do that. You know, yeah. Who, who's, who's willing to try and win a copy card? And I got three, four hands go up. So, and if all three of them get it, I give them all three a copy card, and that's out of my pocket. Nice. Because it just helps reinforce what we're holding them right. accountable to. If I'm working on the floor, I better be doing the same thing. Right. I better be using that scripting appropriately. Yep. I had the um, pleasure of serving my hospital board president this mm -hmm. week mm -hmm. as a dietary aide. And I went up there, and he likes to visit. And so we were visiting, and I said, okay, I'm going to deliver your tray now, and I'm on duty, so I need to ask your birth date and full name. And he just started laughing. He goes, but don't you know me? I said, I do, but this is part of my job, and I, I have to ask this. And so he gave it to me, and he got a good chuckle out of it. And, but it, you know, yeah. it doesn't matter how well I know that person. I still need to follow those protocols. Right. And, you know, and getting those people, I, you know, I had a patient the other day that was cold. Yeah. And she's not going to eat when she's sitting there shivering. Right. You know, giving my staff the freedom to say, let me go get you a warm blanket mm -hmm. and showing them where that's at and how to do that. You know, giving mm -hmm. them that little extra step so that they're comfortable and confident. Sure. You can't teach that in a video. True. You know, you have to walk them through. But the, you know, the basic, the hand washing, the, you know, how to cook certain the things. Tasks. The tasks. Right. Yes, absolutely, because it frees up all that extra time right. where they're doing the job instead of sitting in a classroom. And, and I hope I hope uh, a lot of operators or managers really recognize the the time investment uh, that it takes to do an online training program like the Pineapple Academy is designed to make make to give you more time for other things. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean you ignore training or doesn't mean that you're not responsible for it. It just means it's just a different way of doing it. And hey, it's actually kind of fun, yeah. and it's it should make your life easier. We're really we really are trying to make everybody's life easier up and down the the uh, organization. And so um, I, I think I think that's the piece that gets me excited just to see how we can create uh, those opportunities for people for more education and more time to do things that that are important, like direct contact with customers. Or direct contact. Well, people with learn staff. differently too. Right. Well, yeah. So if they have the opportunity to watch the video and then demonstrate, I'm giving them two different ways to learn right. that task right. and make sure that they're doing it correctly. And instead of them me just saying, "Okay, I want you to do A, B, and C," now they've got a video they can watch, questions to answer at the end on the why behind that right. or how, and then demonstrate that for me. So right. I really do like that because people learn differently. Right. You know, and I may have an employee that, you know, the video learning just doesn't work, then we do something different. Right. But the majority of them, that, you know, short 10 minutes they spend in the office watching that video and then coming out and showing me what they learn, frees up how much time. Sure. Wow, that's a great, great way to put it. So uh, my last question for you is, so where would you like to see the Pineapple Academy go and, and what, what else can we do to make um, the experience at, at your job and for your staff even better? So on the cafe side, I love the customer service direction you're taking a mm -hmm. lot of the um, newer stuff. Mm -hmm. Just because, again, you don't always have time to teach them some of those things. Mm -hmm. So that's really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, the EVS side, I'm really excited about the EVS side because, mm -hmm. again, onboarding is a big struggle yeah. of taking the time to train somebody where, you know, they can go in and see how to clean a room and then my director can go in there with them mm -hmm. and see where we need to fine tune from that point compared to them shadowing somebody mm -hmm. for days and days and then say, okay, do you got this yet? Mm -hmm. Because you know, a lot of this is going on mm -hmm. when that's happening and they're maybe not necessarily paying attention to what they should be doing mm -hmm. where the video maybe will keep them a little more focused. So I'm pretty excited about that. Well, I'm going to share with you a, uh, a new product that we're going to be offering through Expandshare because I know you're on Expandshare mm -hmm. using our platform. And so um, Expandshare has come out with a digital checklist. And so I would like to uh, introduce that product to you and, and have you try it and use it uh, to see where you think it can go. But basically it's already been built. Uh, the first thing I gave them um, as a checklist was the uh, CMS um, 
competency check for food service. Okay. And so that way we had something already pre-built in it. But I also know there's probably going to need, need one for joint commission and, and other regulatory aspects of it uh, just as an audit tool. But more importantly, it'd be interesting to see how it could be applied using Pineapple Academy along with a day-to-day -day checklist for production. And I, I'd be interested uh, for you to evaluate that because that could be, it could be interesting. I like the audit idea because my current too. mock survey sheet is like 15 pages long. Right. Well, what's nice about this is you can end up with a report. You can show, you'll see the gaps and then your plan of correction is the Pineapple Academy. I mean, you've already got, you know, well, or soon to have all the content you need to address all those issues. And you can just do assignments to the team on, on where those gaps are. I'm like, okay, guys, we just did this, and this was the percentage that, that you know, we got, and we're missing, here's our gaps, and therefore we're gonna do this as a plan of correction to be prepared. That's great. Yeah. Because that is one thing, you know, you, you pound in the survey readiness every yes. day, and things still slide, so they that sure would be do. great. Yeah, so it'll be interesting. So yeah. I'll be sharing that with you here probably in the next few weeks. So Wonderful. It'll be pretty awesome. Thank you. Well, Felicia Smith, uh, we come to the end of this conversation. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for hosting us this week. It, we've had a terrific week here. Thank you.